Hello, I'm Val Belton. I'm Professor of Management Science in the Department of Management Science in the Business School here at Strathclyde. I'm going to be talking today about aspects of decision making, uh, both in the context of, of personal decisions, but also in the, the broader business managerial organisational context. And the importance of decisions can't be understated, both in our personal lives and our, our professional lives. And a couple of quotes here that, uh, that illustrate that. As the first one says, decisions underpin everything. They're the coin of the realm in a business. And every success, every failure, every mishap, every opportunity or an opportunity missed is a result of a decision that somebody made or failed to make. Um, the second quote is also indicating that uh, they're pervasive, they're the essence of management, they're what managers do, sit around all day making or not making decisions. Uh, we're judged as managers on outcomes and most of them, the managers that is, not the outcomes, don't have the foggiest idea of what they're actually doing, how they're actually making the decisions, how to actually do them better. So hopefully by the end of this short session, you'll have a sense of some of the, the issues and concerns that underpin decision making. It's an absolutely huge field. Almost every domain in business and more broadly is concerned in some ways with decision making. But underpinning it all uh, is the work that actually stems from psychology. And the, the person in the, the picture here is uh, Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he's a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton University in the, the US. And he was awarded a Nobel Prize for economics uh, in 2002, but he's been working in this field for well over 30 years uh, in the, uh, the area of behavioural decision making with his original colleague Amos Tversky and a long uh, list of, of successive colleagues that have, have worked with him and he really is the, the guru in this area. I've also shown there a, a very small selection of, of books from my, my own bookshelf that relate to the area of decision making and they range from the uh, the very sort of academic tome, for example, the the one on the uh, uh, the, the right there, or is it the left? Thinking and, and Deciding by Jonathan Barron is one of the sort of recognised academic texts that is essential for anyone studying deci uh, decision making from the cognitive and psychological perspective. Uh, we've also got Danny Kahneman's own recent book there, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is actually looking at different aspects of, of decision making. It's a very interesting read. A number of popular books in recent years have been published around decision making. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book called Blink, which is actually advocating or telling us about situations where uh, real expert knowledge enables people to take decisions without apparently even thinking about it. And we'll come back briefly to that later. Uh, Predictably Irrational by Daniel, Daniel Ariely, I think you actually pronounce his name, uh, is something else that's worth looking at. And there's a very interesting video on the, the TED video series of Daniel talking about some of his work and some of the material that I'll be talking about today. The Harvard Business Review is uh, a good overview of what's going on in the decision-making field. Uh, it was published back in 2006, so it's uh, a few years old now, but it gives a good summary of the development of the field and covers uh, the, the aspects that we're going to be talking about and many other aspects of decision making. So it's a good compact reference point that spans a lot of uh, areas of the de decision making field. When we're talking about decision making, we tend to look at it from a number of different perspectives. And on the one hand, and this is a perspective that psychologists are, are mostly concerned about, how people actually decide. Uh, what, what are we doing? What's going through our heads? Uh, what's working well? What's not working well when we're making decisions? So the descriptive theory of, of choice. Uh, people like myself, management scientists, economists, lots of other business professional, professionals tend to be more concerned about prescriptive or normative theory of choice. So how should people decide? What are good ways of making decisions? And going further than that, uh, what are the axioms that should underpin a good decision-making process? Uh, what are the, the basic building blocks of a, a normative theory? It's very difficult to tell people what to do uh, using a theory like that. 
So the approach that has evolved much more in recent years uh, is a more facilitative approach. It takes cognizance of both the prescriptive and normative theories and some of the, the descriptive problems to really help uh, people in, in practice make good decisions. And that's the area where I do my research and uh, uh, work with external organisations. We're going to start off by looking at the, the psychological perspective. I don't know whether you, each of you think you're a good decision maker at the moment, but perhaps looking at some of the examples that we're going to over the, the next 10 minutes or so might cause you to, to question that. Just going to start off by looking at some visual things. You might have already seen this, uh, uh, this conundrum, uh, this illusion. The question is which line is the longest? Which do you think is the, the longest? Certainly when I first saw it, I've seen it many times since, uh, it seemed obvious to me that the top line, just the line, is the, the longest line. The bottom one is, is shorter. But the, the use of the arrows on the end causes us to think that in practice, uh, the two lines are exactly the same length. This is known as the Muller-Lyer paradox, and it's very long-standing. I don't know how long it dates back in psychology. And if you move the lines, you can see that they are indeed actually the same length. Were you tricked by it? Maybe, maybe not. Here's a slightly more complicated one. Uh, the same idea, it's also a, a visual illusion. Uh, there are two tables that look apparently very different sizes, but it's the dimensionality that's actually making them look different. And if I could actually pick up and move those tables, um, which would happen if you actually go to the, uh, the web links that, that's indicated there, you'll see the tables move and you'll see that as the one that's on the, the left-hand side is turned around, it's exactly the same size as the, the one on the right. Uh, get your ruler out and measure them if you're actually looking at this on a screen. I'm not able to do that as I'm talking to you at the moment, but even a, a simple ruler will show you that those dimensions are exactly the same. Amazing, isn't it? So those are visual illusions. Uh, visual illusions are not so key in uh, uh, decision making, but they're a good way of illustrating how our brain can be tricked into thinking things uh, are different to, to what they actually are in practice. So the, uh, the sort of thinking parallel with the visual illusions are sort of cognitive illusions. And what I'm going to do now is go on and uh, show you some examples that illustrate some common cognitive illusions. So, you to imagine yourself in a couple of decision situations. You decided quite a while ago that you wanted to go to a particular concert, whatever your taste is, whether it's rock music, ballet, whatever. You've bought a ticket and it costs you £30. But as you actually arrive at the concert hall, you discover you've lost the ticket. Maybe you've left it at home, maybe you've lost it completely, but there's no way you're actually going to retrieve it because the concert's going to start in, in 10 minutes. You can't go in without a ticket, but there are tickets that are still available. At the same cost, they're still £30, and you've actually got money in your pocket, and you've got more money in the bank. Um, will you actually buy another ticket? Now, most people, when they're actually presented with that dilemma, um, or the majority of them say, no, they won't. How about if we look at the essentially the same problem, but express it slightly differently? You've decided to go to the concert, same context, bought the ticket. No, the, the tickets are going to cost £30, but you haven't yet bought them. As you go into the concert hall, you realise that you've lost £30 from your wallet. Tickets are still available. You've got more money uh, in your wallet to buy a ticket. Do you buy a ticket? And if you present people with, with this option, the majority of them, more than 50%, say they'll actually buy another ticket. As far as the individual that's behind this is, is concerned, it's exactly the same situation. Uh, you're £60 worse off in total. In the, the first case, £30 of it went on the original ticket and £30 on the, uh, the second ticket if you bought it. And in the second one, if you decide to go, you've lost £30 that was unspecified and you've paid £30 to go into the concert. So you're in exactly the same position, but somehow it feels different. People are much more willing to pay in the second uh, situation than they are in the first. Why is that? Why do you think they're actually doing that? 
and it's because they're looking at the history they're actually attaching the 230 pounds in the first instance to the ticket and thinking they've paid 60 pounds for the ticket which feels too much whereas in the second situation that 30 pounds that you lost from your wallet wasn't actually attached to the ticket it was nothing to do with it and so the psychology of it is that you're still only paying 30 pounds for your ticket despite ending up in the uh, um, the same situation as the first one. So, did that puzzle you? Were you uh, caught out by that? The nicest way to actually do this is to have an audience here and to split the audience and actually get them to make the decisions and demonstrate that this actually happens. But take my word for it, it does. I've done it many times with large audiences of students and you always get the same results. And you'll discover if you go and look at some of the, uh, the uh, TED videos that I just talked about that uh, other people are talking about exactly the same sorts of concepts. Here's a, another example. Um, we're moving into a realm that's often referred to as, as framing in the context of, of decision making. So how you actually present the, the issue to the, uh, the person or people who've actually got to make the, the decision. So the way that you do that can subtly change the way that they, they behave. And this is an example of a situation which is, has quite a big impact in society. The particular example here is a real example in the United States. And two, uh, two states, two adjacent states, uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, were looking to introduce a, a new approach to car insurance. And there were two possibilities that were being offered to the, uh, uh, to the car drivers, that they could either pay less for their insurance, so they pay a lower cost and they have a limited right to sue, or they pay a higher cost and they have a full right to sue. I'm not sure what the exact implications of that are in the States, but that's how it's actually described. But completely without consulting with each other about the, the way they were going to go about doing this, the two states offered the options in a different way to the, uh, uh, to the population in the state. So in state one, which I think was New Jersey, you, I'll just check. So in state one, which was New Jersey, they presented the options where the default was to go for the, the lower cost option with a limited right to sue. Um, so all car owners, uh, all insurance uh, owners were actually sent a document and they were presented a document that said, this is the default. Um, if you actually want to change the default, you can. The, uh, the other option was explained, fully explained, as it says there. Um, please tick a certain box. And in state two, which was Pennsylvania, it was the other way around. The default was the higher cost option. So what actually happened in practice? In New Jersey, 80% of the, the people who actually received this form stayed with the default. So they went for the lower cost, limited right to sue option. In Pennsylvania, 75% stayed with the default. The higher cost, full right to sue. So the opposite split in the population. Um, apparently just influenced by whether or not they had to make a decision to, to move away from the, the default. And the cost of that to the state of New Jersey was of the order of, of 200 million pounds, we're told. And the example comes from one of the papers that's in that issue of uh, Harvard Business Review that I mentioned earlier. So is this a one-off example? No, it's not. Another situation in which exactly the same thing happens uh, is decisions about organ organ donation. So if someone is, a, is in an accident and they have to, uh, and they've been killed by that, unfortunately, whether or not they actually make their organs available for donation uh, differs from country to country. In some countries, the default is that if that actually happens, the organs are automatically taken for, for donation. In other countries, as in the, the UK currently, it's the other way around. And surprise, surprise, people actually stay with the, the default. So whether, where they're presented with options, if the default is that the organs are available for donation, uh, they will take that. Where it's the other way around, they will take the, the other one. And this is why we find ourselves in the UK with a situation where there are far more people needing uh, organs donated than organs that are available from tragic accidents such as car crashes. So in both cases, 
the framing of the problem in the way that it's actually presented is influencing the, the decisions. And it's influenced in, in a way, which is in a number of, of different ways, that people avoid making a decision. If there's a default there that seems reasonable, they stick with it, rather than sitting back and weighing up the pros and cons of the two decisions and actually deciding which is best for, for them.